It's a pleasure to have uh, Ginny Hughes, Virginia Hughes here, and Lee will give you the formal introduction. Uh, but it's wonderful to have somebody like Jenny here who at a, a relatively early in her career has done really great work. Uh, and uh, I don't know what she's going to do next, but it's going to be even better all that. But no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I'm Dan Fagan. I'm the director of the science writing, science journalism program here at the Carter Institute of Journalism. Uh, thank you to those of you who I don't know for thank you for coming and to those of you who I do know okay thank you too. Uh, Lee Holtz uh, as always is our host. He is a distinguished writer in residence uh, here at the Carter Institute and is also science writer extraordinaire for the Wall Street Journal and uh, Lee will introduce Jenny formally. We are very lucky to have here this evening Virginia Hughes um, whom some of you know um, who has uh, uh, already um, established herself as a, as a very creative and, and uh, leading uh, blogger, uh, long-form science journalist, um, and uh, multimedia impresario um, for Virginia Hughes, Inc. <laughs> and what we'd like to explore with Virginia tonight um, is how she makes this happen, because it's interesting, um, as we'll learn, that she writes uh, she's very productive, very prolific. Her writing is much honored. It was included in the 2012 uh, Best American Science Writing. Um, uh, Pete Long piece she did recently for Nature was one of their 10 best pieces of the year. Um, there's no paper product in here. There's no hard holding your hand magazine. There's no unfolded in your lap on the subway newspaper. Um, you are, you know, what everybody has uh, aspired to, been terrified of, um, hoped for, the successful working freefall um, career of an <laughs> online science I hope journalist. It's not a freefall. Well, freefall, <laughs> if you've seen gravity, freefall is actually kind of a wonderful balletic yeah. thing, you know? It's the absence of gravity, right? It's the, <laughs> that sort of ability to do ballets. Uh, while you're waiting for the uh, shrapnel of other broken up satellites to <laughs> come whizzing out of the thing. So let's begin, if I may. Um, sure. <laughs> now that I've put you nicely on yeah. the spot. Um, so beginnings are beginnings, and let's start there. So you didn't go to school to become a journalist. You, you actually were interested in neuroscience. You were at Brown. How did, you, how did you work through that? Tell us about that a little bit. To writing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have always loved science and I thought for a long time that I would be a scientist. I never liked medicine. I don't like blood and I'm too squeamish, but I thought I'd, I like <clears throat> things I can control. It's funny that you talk about risk because anyone who knows me knows I'm very risk averse. I don't like change. I don't like risky things at all. I like control and um, reason, and so science always appealed to me in math, I think, for that reason. But uh, I had, so I was studying neuroscience in college and just kind of focused on that. Um, and then I, I studied abroad in Paris for a semester. So with this, well, let's back up here. So this is Brown. Mm -hmm. So you're studying the brain. Yes. Uh, what kind of neuroscientists are you aspiring to be? I mean, what's, what's your interest there? You don't like blood. Well, the brain doesn't actually bleed, so you're you're, right. you're safe there. <laughs> well, I can, so I I started actually as a chemistry major, and um, you know the the requirements for chemistry and neuroscience were very similar. Uh, and then my sophomore year, I think uh, either first or second semester, I took a neuroscience course for the first time, and it. It was life changing. I mean, it was the first time I ever was taught what a neuron was, and um, the way the brain works was like this amazing mix of physics and chemistry and biology in a way that made that was utterly grounded in me and and us and everything that we do. Um, so this is, sounds very lofty, but it was it grabbed me in a way that chemistry never did. Um, so I switched to neuroscience, and I um, 
you know, you ask what kind of neuroscience. As an undergraduate, the neuroscience curriculum is just a lot of biology and chemistry courses, honestly. It's not that much different. So it's a lot of wet work. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Until you get to be a senior, and then you can start specializing in, uh, um, I took some, some neuro lab courses where we did, we studied frog neurons, um, and I took some seminars about uh, cognitive science, actually, about Gibson's theories of ecological, um, you know, that we aren't just a brain, that we actually interact with the environment all the time and that we're constantly um, responding to our environment. It's not just like a top-down intelligence. Um, see what I love perception, visual perception, um, all of our stuff about our senses and how the olfactory system works and how the vestibular system works. Mm -hmm. And it was basically sort of like sort of like anatomy 101, I guess, of like, this is how your nose works, and this is how your taste buds work, and this is, so it wasn't, it wasn't very sophisticated then. I think as a writer, writing about neuroscience, I've learned a lot more about it than mm -hmm. I ever did mm -hmm. in school. Yeah, yeah, but let's keep you with the school, because you were actually, as a student, pretty successful. Yeah. Getting up on, and you have a meeting with your advisor about, yeah. like, let's, let's, let's think about what kind of honors project you should do, Virginia, yeah. and what happens. So I had just gotten back from a semester, a little more than a, a semester plus a summer in Paris. And uh, because of how um, basically Brown wouldn't accept any science credits from my Parisian university. So I wasn't allowed to take any science when I was in Paris, which was fine. I was drinking a lot of wine and taking art classes. Um, so I got back and it just that semester away from science made me realize that I wasn't, you know, my advisor said to me, what do you want to do for your honors project? And I said, I'd, I'm sorry, I just don't want to be in the lab anymore. It's not, it's not for me. I'm not, I've, I'm not focused enough or dedicated enough to like pick at one tiny little mechanistic question for years and years and years. Um, and he was very gracious about it and said, that's okay. And you can still work, you know, I'll pay you now. You can be, a, you can be like a research assistant. And so then I just started, um, when I was away, when I was abroad, I started writing for the first time really of like, travel little essays about what I was seeing um, on my travels. Uh, you writing for a diary, writing for yeah. emails to friends, uh, writing for the Paris Review? I mean, what? Uh, I mean, I don't think it was directed at all. It was, uh, actually it was in Austria in this tiny little town and I saw the weirdest thing I think maybe I've ever seen. It was like this giant, it was a little museum, and inside the museum was this giant machine. It was called a, um, started with W, and it was this long German word. But it was sort of like a giant Rube Goldberg machine, and somebody had built it just for the hell of it. And it was all these weird pulleys and contraptions, and like there was no rhyme or reason to it except that somebody wanted to like make this mechanical marvel. And I thought it was so weird, and the people who ran the museum were so weird. And so I just, I just wrote a little essay about that because I, I don't, honestly, I don't know why. I just felt like it was a weird thing that the world, that should be recorded in the, mm -hmm. in the historical record, I guess. And then I ended up turning that into a piece for the college. Uh, there was a science magazine on, on campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you started writing for them? Yeah, I started writing for mm -hmm. them and I took a journalism class for the first time and at that time, I thought maybe I'll maybe I'll work for a science museum, or I didn't really know there was this thing called science journalism that you could you could go to a program like this and and learn about it. I just uh, I don't know. I was applying to all kinds. Of, there were recruiters on campus my senior year from hedge funds and um, Wall Street and teach you know independent private schools looking for teachers, uh, and I was applying to everything. Um, all of that. So and you're pretty unfocused here. I was you're very just like, unfocused, yeah. Yeah, yeah, kind of a, you've turned your back on what you thought was your, you know, and now you're just in free fall. Yeah, except I did know somewhere in that early on in that first semester senior year, I learned mm -hmm. about this thing called science writing and that there were these programs and I thought, oh good, I can, I'm, you know, I can apply to school and I can get into some kind of program. So, <laughs> so you, then I'd you have ended something up, to do. You ended up at Johns Hopkins? Yeah. And, but that wasn't really a reporting program, that's a writing program. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, I can't say I really understood the difference. Well, explain, you know, I what didn't, do you mean? I had just taken one or two journalism classes in college and it didn't, uh, I didn't really know what I was in for in going to this program. I honestly thought Hopkins, uh, at, 
which no longer exists, um, had an amazing, like I didn't, they had a fellowship basically, so I didn't have to pay any tuition. So it was, and it was a one year program and it was a master's degree at the end. So I thought, well, I'll figure out what it is when I get there, kind of. And at the end of it, I'll have a master's degree and I can, I have something to tell my family that I'm doing for the next uh, so year. So this is really a way of postponing like important decision. decisions. decision, yeah. Okay, okay. And then luckily I really loved it. I mean, yeah. I, I just really loved reporting. Um, which but you I were in most, basically though, if, if I understand correctly, you were really in with kind of creative fiction writers. Yeah, the Hopkins program was in the writing seminars. So I, my friends, there were only four of us in the science writing program. And we were in the same department with the poetry MFA and the fiction MFA, which are both at Hopkins very good programs with kind of very famous fiction writers. Alex, um, Alice McDermott is there and a whole bunch of other people. So my friends were poets and fiction writers. And all of our events like this were you know, po poetry slams and um, things where we would swap, where we do readings, but science writers could only read. You'd have to write poems or fiction. And fiction writers had to write science writing. And um, it, was, it was focused on craft. And Finkbeiner, mm -hmm. who until mm -hmm. recently led yeah. the program, was an English major. And, um, it was about you know the writing, not about for better for us, not about the reporting, not about the journalism so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. I loved it. It was because I didn't have much of a writing background. I had spent all those years in college, mostly in science classes and uh, French classes. So it was a, it was great for me to have that. Yeah. <clears throat> so having sort of spent your first part of your undergraduate career study, studying the brain, you decided that, well, maybe you'd start using it. For <laughs> so there you are, you've postponed these decisions for a while, I'm very deft, I must say, you know, the, the all expenses paid masters is a good way of Because we know how valuable up. master's degrees are. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, do, it's, done well for, it's done well for me, that's as far as I got, you know. Um, uh, my wife's a PhD, so it allows me to hold my head oh, up there at you home. Go. So, you know. um, but, there you are, you have only a, a passing acquaintance with journalism as a literature of fact, if I can put it that way, um, uh, but uh, uh, very good at the poetry slam business now. So, <laughs> But you get a series of interesting internships. I did, yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, so while I was in school, uh, my second semester was crazy. I did two internships at the same time, which I would not recommend. Um, with? With NPR's Science Desk right. in DC. So that was also crazy because I. Hopkins is in Baltimore, and so I had to commute to DC for the internship, which was annoying. And then um, the other internship, which was fantastic, was uh, for the Johns Hopkins Alumni Magazine, which doesn't sound like a very flashy opportunity, but it was a very small staff. And you know, alumni, I don't know if you guys read alumni magazines, but they're very focused on narrative and interesting profiles and stories. and. At Hopkins, at least, it really isn't, of course, an alumni magazine is a vehicle for development for the school, for them to raise money. But it's, it's also like uh, just a narrative crafty thing. It's, it's, um, they really pride themselves on real stories and, and close to journalism. It's not exactly journalism because they're promoting their own researchers, but they're all trained journalists who work there and, and the people who work who continue to work at the Hopkins Magazine are really top-notch writers. So, but more importantly, from my perspective, they let me attend all the story meetings, the art meetings, and at the end of the internship, I wrote uh, my first narrative feature for them. So this was really your ex first exposure, if I can put it this way, to sort of the actual production of an act of journalism, if such a thing can be yeah. put in quotation marks like that. So what was your first feature? What? Is it something oh, they it was just such a great you? story. Was it your idea? No, it was that? my idea. Um, it was about one of the poets in the program. His name was Frank Gallimore, and mm. he was um, he grew up in a deaf family. Both of his parents and all of his siblings were deaf, but he could hear. And so he grew up as an American Sign Language, his first native language. Hmm. And then he and also he was biracial, so he and he grew up to be a poet. That in his poetry. Uh, like w what made him very famous was his lyricism, like the, hmm. and so that he was straddling all these cultures, and so it gave me by profiling him, it gave me a way to talk about the deaf culture, African American culture, and um, and 
how he feels that his work and the great thing about his work can't fully be appreciated by his family because it's lyric. It's it's about it's meant musical to be and spoken meant aloud. To be, yeah, meant to be spoken yeah. aloud. Yeah, it's the best poetry is, of course. Yeah. yeah. So um, there you are. Now you've got some experience. You uh, where do you where do you where does gravity take you? So it wasn't gravity so much as a you know crazy internship. You, you guys know, I'm sure you're like applying for every internship that exists because you're afraid that you're never going to work. Um, so I just applied to every internship I heard of and happened to get one at Discover in New York City. Mm -hmm. So I moved to New York City um, and I was Discover Magazine's, this was in uh, 2006, Discover Magazine's first web intern which is crazy now, right? Like they, they didn't have, they, they had just hired, or they just made one of their editors, Amos, who's now left Discover, but he was their first web editor, and then he, they were like, you can have an intern, so they had an intern. So you were sort of present at the creation. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody know what they were doing? Uh, not really. I mean, Amos and I were kind of like learning HTML as we went along. Um, and at that time we were just, I mean, I wrote a few stories that were web exclusives or only online, but most of it honestly was about, and it was very helpful to me later, it was about learning pr web production, which is not a difficult skill, but it is a skill of um, how, to, how to take an article that was in the magazine and turn it into a web piece, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is all like HTML essentially and, and learning Basically, learning what I need now for for blogging software. Um, you blog on WordPress, or do you use something else? I do. I blog on yeah, WordPress. Okay. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Some of the best people blog on WordPress. <laughs> um, I had, didn't always. I used to do more. Uh, so after Discover, I worked at Seed. I did another internship uh, for Seed Magazine, and I was there again, a web intern. Except they, at that time, were their web team was led by Christopher Mims, who's now mm -hmm. at Quartz, sure. yeah. and they were just a well-oiled machine. I mean, we did, I was doing at least two stories a week, and there were five interns, so we were, we were just doing stories. Now this like is crazy. at a time, well, we'll kind of back up, but if, just to stay with this for a second. So this is at Seed, this is the community blogging network at Seed, yeah? Uh, before that, actually, I did oh, okay. this, intern, this news internship. All right, okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. And then I did the blogging thing after that. All right, but well let's, let's then stay with it. Because one of the things I'm hearing here, and it's an interesting skill, you seem to have a, a talent for getting people to actually answer your queries. Um, <laughs> well, no, it's, it's uh, uh, easily overlooked as a, as a skill, and I don't know if you've thought about this or not. I mean, I'm certainly have had some very successful people here who in part got their start because they couldn't get anybody to respond to the letters they wrote, or they couldn't get anybody to respond to their phone calls. And, then by circuitous and sometimes very creative ways ended up with doing marvelous things. But I'm listening to you here and clearly people answer your phone calls or they respond to your letters. It's an interesting series of internships. I mean, do you have a particular trick here, a hook I you mean, throw out over the transom? I don't know. I think, um, I mean, like how, how I got that NPR internship which was a very prestigious internship, I don't know. I think that one of my professors at the time, who's uh, Tom Hayden, he's now at the Stanford, I think he, I think they called him uh, for a reference and he basically did something. He gave the money did, or something? Yeah, I yeah, don't know. Okay. I think right, well, he, no, I'm, I'm curious because the ability to get response to queries is the essence of pitch, of course. I mean, maybe and it was like because I had a Brown degree, they, oh, I, I don't I know. See, I, I see. don't know well, what the, because I certainly wasn't good then. Like, I didn't well, know what I was doing. I didn't well, know anything. So I didn't, didn't want to say that. But that's kind of <laughs> what I was wondering. No, so, I um, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> But now you did something interesting that I, I'd like to, to ask you about. So, okay, here we are. This is great. It's kind of nice. Rung upon rung upon rung. Oh, NPR, that's good. Oh, you're doing something at Discovery. This all sounds very, you know, linear and, and upwardly mobile and all that. But then you kind of get this thing working with this strange kind of industrial trade group magazine thing. Yeah. Boss? Yeah, Boss. Boss. <laughs> okay, tell us about Boss. 
So my, the editor-in-chief, this is why, this is one of the reasons why that John Hopkins Magazine internship was so great, is because the editor-in-chief, whose name is Sue De Pasquale, um, was just one of these A-type people, and she was a freelance, not only did she run the whole Hopkins Magazine, but she was a freelance editor for a suite of other publications. At both at Hopkins, because an institution like Hopkins has, I don't know how many different magazines they put out for its different schools and hospitals and newsletters and all that, but other, um, what do you call them, you know, custom publications or... Trade journals. Trade, yeah. Trade magazines, newsletters. Yeah, and she was very connected uh, in Baltimore with some other people who do the same thing. I mean, I, I guess mo may, you probably don't realize, because I didn't realize, like, there are so many magazines out there that are just niche publications for, like the company that just bought Discover, Kalmbach, their thing is like toy trains or something. They have magazines about toy train, for toy train collectors. And so I started writing for places like that. Not that one, but Boss was a great client. Boss is this magazine, it still exists. It's published by a Valve, Manufacturing Valve company. Valve manufacturing, Valve. right, yeah. And from what I gather, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it goes out to like all of their customers, so auto mechanics and industrial clients. And But the stories are, um, it, so the magazine itself is just a vehicle, I think, for their ads. Like every other page is a, is a um, ad for, I don't even remember what the name of the company, no, I don't remember what the name of the company is. Dixon, Dixon Valve. But the stories were like, so I always wrote the cover story. There were only like six stories in, the, in every issue. Um, and the cover story- Were they story, all about valves? I don't know. No, no, no. Yeah. Different parts of internal combustion engines. No, they were just mechanical. They were aimed at people who are interested in the mechanics of things. So I wrote a cover story about skyscrapers and one about, and literally my editor would be like, okay, your topic this, this time is dams or, paper making or um, electricity or cargo ships. And so it was a great practice. First of all, I think it was 4,000, each one was 4,000 words and they paid decently. Decently in this context is? I think it was around a dollar a word. Dollar a word is? For me then, at that length, it was great. It was great money. Um, but it also just gave me practice in like finding a story because I was trained, story. you know, I was doing journalism at that point, so I just didn't, I didn't want to write a review article, a Wikipedia entry on skyscrapers. I wanted to, like, find an actual narrative to, to write. So, and that's hard to do, to take a topic and turn it into a, something resembling a story. So, that was a great client. So, I'm just curious now, because you've raised a kind of an interesting technical matter. How do you how do you turn a topic into a story? How do you turn it? You use those things. How do you how do you how did you turn that into a narrative? Um, oh, Virginia, you know, I'd like something <coughs> about. Oh, I don't know. Hmm, paper. Well, I went to. Uh, I I called up a paper mill in Albany, and I went and visited them. Just out of the blue. Yeah, and they, you know, how many times did they get reporters coming to them wanting to do a story? So they were like, sure. And so that one was more of a process thing where I think the narrative was just like from beginning to end, like how does paper get made at this plant? And then weaved into it was like kind of the history of paper and stuff. Um, so that one was actually pretty straightforward. But the cargo ship one, that was my first one. Um, and that was just, oh, tell us 4,000 words about cargo ships? Yeah. That's pretty open-ended. Yeah. I read a couple of books. I read a great book called The Box, which is by Mark. Somebody it was a oh, really fantastic, yeah, yeah, yeah. on container ships. Um, I don't know the way. I I don't know uh, the answer is to that except I I just call a lot of people and wait for them to tell me some kind of interesting story and then take that as the as the lead. <laughs> I don't. I the only way to find a story from a topic is to call a lot of people and I have them just talk to you about about their expertise. So it sounds like Boss, this kind of strangely permissive trade journal, uh, was kind of a boot camp for you. I mean... Uh, for long form, for long, for long pieces, form, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, my kind of, for news stories, I, you know, I was doing 
see it and discover and nature and so that but for long pieces yeah nobody's gonna let me do a long a long piece I'm not gonna get a feature and discover at that point so yeah so Jenny how did you know that yeah. you know they were any good I assume that nobody at, oh I wouldn't nobody I don't at the magazine even, could give you that kind of feedback Key question. I don't, could they? I would not recommend reading them right now. I don't think anyone should go look those up. Well, I mean, the editors I was working with weren't hacks. They had journalism experience. So I don't think they were terrible. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't want to, I'm not going to go back and read them and tell you if they were bad or not. I think, honestly, it kind of doesn't matter. Like, some of it is just uh, doing it over and over and over again. So. They probably weren't very good. I don't know. I guess I could. <laughs> They're all on my website. I have I have archived of everything I've ever written on my website. So. Indeed, you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should I should emphasize that Dan's um, essentially cued me here that as soon as we move forward, it's important to realize this is a conversation. This is not a lecture. Um, and as we get into things that interest you more than other things, I want to encourage you to interrupt this, ask your questions that come to you and help us digress in interesting and creative ways. And um, Dan has a microphone somewhere on top of his head at the moment. Um, and uh, so please, please uh, join when you, when you feel so, uh, so motivated. Now, I'd like to just take a second here and, and have you, so there you are, you've gone through this interesting and circuitous, because all beginnings are circuitous, um, journey, the neurosciences slash uh, poet slam slash uh, <laughs> industrial trade magazine uh, NPR uh, sound maven. Um, describe for us now your portfolio now. Hmm. You have uh, only human blog on National Geographic. Um, you write long form as a contributing editor to Matter, mm -hmm. uh, which for those of you who don't know is a, a relatively new and pretty interesting online uh, long-form uh, publishing venture, um, not unlike The Atavist um, uh, and others. Uh, you also um, have written long-form for Eon, or Aeon, I guess, um, magazine. Yeah, I don't know how they Does anybody that. know, actually? A-E-O-N, um, which is a fascinating, another online long-form venture that, that sort of tries to highlight a different general scientific technical topic on a different day of the week. It's kind of an interesting publishing model. Um, so like Monday is the human body and Tuesday is insights into molecular things and, and it's a rhythm. But you also have uh, uh, been part of the uh, Not the Last Word. Last uh, Word on Nothing. Last yeah. Word on Nothing uh, blog collective. Um, just, sort of, just sort of describe the, 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 the balls that you have in the air as part of your daily juggle. Well, I'll add just two more yeah, to the right, list uh, because I think it's. An, I want to get the word out about these new. I think these new publications are great. Nautilus is another new ah, Nautilus, yeah. publication that's been fun to write for. And there's one that's going to debut in March that I'm working on a story for now called Mosaic. Mosaic. And it's funded by the Wellcome Trust hmm. in England, um, but it's entirely journalistic kind of one like a ProPublica model, kind of. Um, and they're weird because, and I kind of grappled with whether I wanted to do this, but all the writers have to sign in the contract that the most uh, permissive Creative Commons license. So all of their content is going to be syndicated. They hope to have it syndicated as widely as possible. Like their goal would be for CNN and Huffington Post and all these other people to just lift their stuff word for word and get it. That's sort of their philanthropic philanthropic mission. Um, so that's another one. That'll, then that's all long form stuff as well. So, so Mosaic, <coughs> uh, Welsh and Trust, Nautilus. Tell us a little bit about Nautilus. Some people may not uh, be familiar with it. <laughs> so Nautilus does themed issues every month. Um, I'm working on one right now for an upcoming mergers and acquisitions um, issue. and. It's interesting, they have, throughout the month, every week, they roll out another section of the quote-unquote magazine. Their funding is interesting. Um, right now, 
so they are an independent entity, uh, for profit, I believe, maybe nonprofit, I don't know. And they are, you know, soliciting money from lots of funders, but for now their only funder is the Templeton Foundation, mm -hmm. which is this religious this foundation that's about like religion and science playing nice together or something, which I don't really uh, endorse and I've I thought a long time before before I accepted. Like I thought, do I want to accept money f essentially from the Templeton Foundation? And your concern was just that this was mixing religion into it, or are, uh, are an they organization asking? with a very uh, defined a defined mission that doesn't coalesce with my values. But I decided that um, it was laundered enough that I could accept the money. <laughs> Well, it's also not an it's not a Templeton publication. It's just that Templeton gives money to lots of scientists and lots of things, including this magazine. And the magazine's soliciting money from lots of people and, and there's also a wall where they're not the Templeton from everything that the editors assure me is not dictating anything about editorial content or policy. So Okay, so you have uh, the National Geographic blog. Mm -hmm. uh, Nautilus long form, uh, mosaic long form. Um, what else? Matter. Oh, right, matter. I'm and sorry. Aeon. Long form. And Aeon. So you've got one, two, three, five, five. Yeah, I guess five, most of them are six. one or two offs for now. But well, yeah, that's what I want to try and get a sense now. This yeah. workflow. So, all right, um, let's take the National Geographic blog. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Some of us read it. Some of us may not have. This is uh, called Only Human, and it mm -hmm. focuses sort of on neuroscience images, uh, uh, issues. Yeah, uh, when I started completely. it, when I started it, I just, um, I th it was very loosely defined as anything, my purview would be anything related to what, like human behavior or what makes humans and what humans do. So that could include like societal stuff. So this is neuroscience writ large. Yeah. I guess human, like human behavior writ mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. um, now, how do you pitch a blog to National Geographic, or did they discover you in the corn patch somewhere? I mean. Yeah, they they approached me and said, "Do you wanna?" So I was blogging for the Last Word on Nothing, which is this group, this wonderful group blog that you guys should all read because the writing is great. And um, I had written one post for them that really took off. And I think that's what caught the attention of Jamie Shreve, who's the, he's an editor at National Geographic and also our blog catheter. Uh, so he said, would you be interested? And if so, what would you do? Like, what would your blog be about? Um, so that's how, that's how it came about. But now, based on like what posts have been popular and what I've kind of gravitated to, it's become much more a blog about um, Cognitive science, psychology, neuroscience, <coughs> genetics. It's, it's kind of like narrowed a little bit from when I started. But you know, it, it, might, it might change. It's kind of loose. It's kind of whatever I want to write about. And <laughs> you post? Once a week. Once a week, and a post is like what? 750 words, 1,000 words, 200 words, uh, 140 characters? It's rare when it's less than 1,000 words. I'd wish I could, I mean, it, everyone says it's harder to write short than long, uh, but I just feel like it's my blog. I can do what I want. I can, <laughs> I can write long if I want. I can go on if I want. It's fine. But, um, you know, so it's about 1,000 about words or 1,500 words per post. I okay, guess. so 150, 100 words once a week. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get too specific, but so say that's like say twenty percent of your income, fifty oh no. percent of your income, oh, no, two no, no, percent no. of your income. <laughs> um, that must be your husband is, laughing. <laughs> that's no, no that's oh, my husband oh, back. Sorry. It <laughs> is um, about twelve percent of my income. Okay, twelve percent, give or take a percentage point, twelve yeah. percent. All right, so I mean, I want to assemble the mosaic here. So okay, so the blog, thousand words a week. Twelve percent. Yeah, so okay. I'm gonna make it to hundred now. I hope. Right. Yeah. Let's 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 work on the other eighty-eight percent. <laughs> I, I guess my now. bread and butter. Uh, I do a piece for Popular Science, uh, usually once a month, maybe slightly less frequent than that. And a piece for Popular Science. So you know you're uh, <clears throat> like a news, like a thousand word or fifteen hundred word piece. Okay. So. And they pay well. They pay 
you know, so that's another, I don't know, 10%. This is hard, because I actually have a lot of clients. Well, this is, yeah, I, I, I have the impression that you do, and I'm, that's why I'm interested <laughs> in going through this, because um, it's actually a fairly intricate and complicated enterprise that you've got going, and it's hard to grab sort of the loose thread, and I'm, I'm going to walk you through this. Okay, so 12% with uh, uh, National Geographic, say another 10 or 15% or so with uh, popular science. So 1,000 words a week, 1,500 words a month. Yeah. Yeah. How do you pitch to popular science? Or do you, again, just have the freedom to sort of say, you know what, I feel like writing about No, no, the it's always like an today. editor frantically saying, can you write, um, you know, I, last week it was like, can you do this meaty infographic on concussions for our Super Bowl issue <laughs> in three days? It's like, yeah, okay. So it's so piece, stuff it's like piece that. work. It's, it's piece, piece work. It's assignments mostly. Like my, I don't, I was saying this to somebody, there's this idea when you get started that you have to pitch every, all the time, and you do when you get started. But now I, I really only pitch long stories that I'm really passionate about. The vast majority of my assignments are assigned, of my stories are assigned. Um, so that's nice, because pitching is a lot of sunken time that you don't get paid for sometimes. So, But I should say, like, the the bulk of my, or 40 or 50 percent of my income comes from this um, news site called safari.org, which is an autism news website. And I've had, I've written for them since 2007, I think, um, very regularly. So, and I do one story, one news story for them every two weeks about, I do something like 25 or 30 stories a year. So that's- For them? Yeah. Okay. And those are just standard, their, their website is aimed at scientists, so they're very, you know, like, take a molecular paper and, it's journalism, but it's directed at a very specific audience uh, who are very, you know, they know, you don't have to explain what a, so it's not a, it's not an advocacy parents no, group no, no. or thing. It's it's is writing for scientists. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I'm going to be interested. Once I walk you through your your income, <laughs> I'm going to walk you through your readership. <laughs> so okay, so what are we now up to? Like around fifty percent, sixty percent? Yeah. All right. So we still got forty percent to work with. So there. I'd say but the long we got a thousand words a week from the blog, fifteen hundred words a month for popular science, thirty twenty stories a year for safari.org uh, about autism science mm -hmm. uh, publications, and that leaves me now where? What are we missing? Because so we haven't talked about any of the long form things yeah. yet, so maybe you're doing those for free, I don't know. No, no, but they're so one off that it's hard to like give it a percentage you know, of the year. So, I mean, I so my new contract with Matter, which just started, is three stories a year. And tell us a little, Matter is relatively new, so yeah, it's tell new. us a little bit about their online niche, what they're... I think they're still figuring it out a little bit. Um, they're I just, less than a year old, right? Yeah. yeah. So they're very new. Um, I just went today to my first editorial meeting with them. It was really fun. They're really, really smart, and they've got a lot of talented people working for them. But basically, it's stories um, more than 6,000 words. Uh, with no upper end point um, about science and technology. That's, and, but I think if I were going to define what a matter story is, it, they're aiming for narrative. They're not so much about explanatory journalism. Like if you have a story about how um, epigenetics works, that's not going to be a matter story. A matter story is going to have something about policy, Maybe it's and like the story I wrote for them is about genetic privacy, how genetic testing is changing our concepts of privacy. So that's obviously like a you know it's a human story, which is why I think I'm gonna hopefully it's really gonna work out with them because it it's kind of touches a lot on the things I like writing about. Um, and you have a contributing relationship with them now, so that's yeah. like what three articles a year. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see, so a thousand words a week with the blog. 1,500 words a month of popular science, uh, 20 to 30 articles a year for uh, safari.org, and three long form, three really serious hits for matter. 
And then, um, sorry, you know, things I, like mosaic. And sorry, can I just follow up on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, please I'm just do. curious how you, how that transition works from just contributing, you know, ah, okay. a one-off yeah. thing to then being, have a more regular, like a contributing writer, contributing editor. Um, do you have any insight into how that transition <laughs> I mean, I was at a or? meeting, I was at the National Association of Science Writers meeting a few weeks ago and my editor, top editor said, do you want to be a contributing editor? <laughs> I don't know. I have I have a couple of friends. I've, this has come up a lot, though, and a couple of my friends have said, I have one friend who is working on a book, and her agent was like, you know, to sell this book when it comes out, you're going to need, we need to, like, juice up your, your titles and stuff. And so she just talked to her editor. I won't say what magazine, but it was basically a very, she's a very regular contributor to a certain magazine, and was like, can you make me a contributing editor? And they were like, sure. So they added her to the masthead. I don't think there's a. I don't think there's any harm if you're contributing regularly to a place, you know, monthly or whatever. I think it's worth having a conversation if you want something. The nice thing about um, the, my relationship with Matter is that it's a regular. Like, I'm not really getting anything that I wouldn't get as a freelancer. Like the pay is the same, and but it's guaranteed and it's you know, part being part of a community and it's steady. Um, so I don't know. I don't I don't have much insight on that, unfortunately. But sort of regularity, being in the right place, being That's in the right That's how time. it worked out for Safari too. I how so? you know well I was writing for them so much anyway that my editor was just like, Do you want to be on contract? And that way we know we can have you for this many stories and you know you're guaranteed this many stories. And it's kind of a mutually beneficial, should be a mu mutually beneficial mm -hmm. situation. Are we up to 100% yet? Yeah, the rest is one-offs. You know, like, I tend, I'm fast. I'm a fast writer. So like, kind of silly, I say silly. I don't mean to be disparaging, but like, if somebody asks me, do you want to do a 600 word story on basically one paper, We'll pay you two dollars a word. I say yeah. I just I never say no to that pretty much because it's I'm fast and it's like an easy supplement. So there's a lot of, you know, this year I wrote for Smithsonian for the first time and um, uh, you know I do I do a couple of features for Nature every year. Um, so there's like there's just I'm, a yeah. I'm I'm. Do you have a business manager? Do you have an agent that gets no, stuff? No, no, Do you no. have a do you have an accountant? No, I you do TurboTax. Turbo I do everything tax, myself. Okay. I've run out of fingers here. Um, so we got the thousand words here, the fifteen hundred. You're making words it here, sound a lot more here. complicated than it is. No, it's I'm not that complicated. I'm just trying to add it. Well, it's not complicated because you're clearly pulling it off. But um, <laughs> I'm wondering. So this is a steady background level now at this point. Okay, so. Let's start at the low end, because I want to talk about how you then manage to nurture long-form projects, which you clearly do in that busy buzz, I don't care how fast you are with your fingers, environment. So what for you goes into a, a, a one-study, 700-word, $2-word, whatever it was, quick hit story? I mean, what, what is a quick hit story for you mechanically? How many calls? How many sources is okay? Oof. You it just really take a paper depends and run it through your mental typewriter. No, and, yeah. if it's a neuroscience story where I feel pretty, where I know the field and I know who to call, that's, you know, say the researcher and three outside sources. And I, you know, I, I know the issues ahead of time. I know what the controversy is ahead of time. So I can just, I know who to go to to, to address each point of the controversy. If it's a subject I've never written about before or that I don't know that much about, then I over report it. Which, which ends up working to my advantage, because let's say for a 700 word story, I call 10 people. Um, you know, most of them are not gonna get into that story, but they might make great blog posts. So I can, I can do a lot of double duty a lot mm -hmm. with the blog. The blog is just whatever, I, I have complete control over it. So even, I've even done like, you know, an anecdote that somebody tells me in an interview, basically just goes up on the blog as like a little story in itself. So um, I over-report, and that's something that I wish I could be more efficient about sometimes. But uh, 
I just I get anxious if I feel like I'm missing until I until I call people and they're repeating back to me things I've already heard. Mm, mm, yeah, um, that's always really a good sign. Yeah, when you meet yourself coming in the door. Yeah, uh, and honestly, I think it saves time in the long run because you know you could do a phone call for 20 minutes that ends up saving you hours of hassle of figuring something out on your own or back and forth with that with an editor who's like, I don't think you really got all this or mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so short, but things like the fastest things are say four phone calls and and a read of the paper and then an hour of writing out a draft, of just turning out a draft. You do so a lot of rewrites on a short story. Nope. <laughs> nope. I mean, uh, it it depends very much. So something there are certain magazines. I'm not going to use any names, but there are certain magazines where I know there's going to be a lot of nonsense with the editing. Nonsense meaning. Meaning. Seeing as we're anonymous, editors, like tell me like okay, exactly. Okay, so what say like about. four levels of editing for a 600 word story, where my first draft, the ending is not going to. It's going to have everybody's thumbprint on it by the time it gets to the end. There's no point in me spending a lot of agonizing over that first draft because I know it's not going to be anything like that. So mm -hmm. just from an efficiency, and you know, you just like check your ego on a story like that. You sign up for it. You don't, you don't sign up for it thinking like this is going to be my baby. And it's like, no, this is a collaborative, at this magazine, it's a collaborative process. And I'm just the one, basically I'm just the one who does the phone calls and does the work. And then all the editors put their little spin on it. Mm -hmm. And there are other places where um, where I feel a real responsibility and a real ownership of it and um, I'm very, very proud of my first draft and I put a lot of time into the first draft. So I think it just comes down to like knowing your <clears throat> your boss, knowing knowing what they want and what they don't and what they mm -hmm. don't what they care about and what they don't care about. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I'm counting this upright, you're writing at least one, maybe two substantial stories a week, just in terms of wordage, as part of your sort of bread and butter. Yeah, you mean approach. like, oh, substantial, you mean just by word count? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, what the Gettysburg Address is like, what, 375 yeah. words or something? There's <laughs> a lot of thought went into that, but no. I just mean, yeah, raw copy output. Probably two, two a week. To, to keep the freelance check writing thing going. So I'm curious, where do you work? Uh, I mean, literally, physically, where are you? Yeah, well, I, un well, not unfortunately, but I, I have a lot of phone calls during the day, so that keeps me chained to my desk most mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. But I do like, like yesterday was a writing day, so I had no phone calls and I went to the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, I spend a lot of time in cafes. But mm -hmm. I have a nice dad. I have a nice setup in my office, and I have an ergonomic chair, and it's actually very comfortable to be in my off in my home office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I spend most of my time in at home. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, what's your community? You, mm. you tell you what, it gets to the question that Dan was asking. So, how do you know what you're doing is on track? And by that, I don't mean well, yeah, the 600-word article was okay because they wrote you the check and they got to rewrite it seven times and that made them happy. But you've got a through line. Um, you're trying to sort of keep growing, keep learning, keep accumulating uh, and polishing your, your set of skills and your set of tools and your, and your whole thought process as a journalist and a writer. One of the things that um, I often wonder about is how uh, a really busy, productive, uh, making it go freelancer keeps uh, themselves nurtured. Yeah, this is the my number one complaint about being a freelance writer is I read all these great books about the craft, and you know there was a new book this year where Tracy Kidder and his editor, whose name I'm blanking on now, they wrote a book about their relationship, and they've had this writer-editor relationship for like 30 or 40 years or something. And they, you know, Tracy Kidder has showed up on his editor's doorstep in the middle of the night. And I, as a freelancer, I do work with the same editors again and again, but they don't, and, and they do obviously guide my work and give me feedback on my work for a particular assignment. But I don't have any editors who say to me, 
you know, Ginny, over, over the last three or four assignments, I've really noticed that you could, you know, you're lacking in X area, or this is a skill that you're really great at and you should, you know, know that, good job, or anything. It's so, and I imagine that that stuff happens more when you're on staff because somebody has to invest in you. If, you're, if they, they're the editor or the manager, that's part of their job. Supposedly, you can tell me if that's. Well, you can see I'm wacky, smiling. So. <laughs> there not should be. There should be more not, of that. Not, not really, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like nobody that? gets mentorship like ever. <laughs> No, that's, that's what grad. Shame, that's right? what grad school's for. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, no, that's the reality of of twenty uh, first century journalism. Is that uh, you know the lot a lot of the mentorship really comes from your peers. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it it comes from the support you get, like from your your fellow Nat Geo bloggers. I know, and, but I don't you know. think Ed Yong would say to me, you know, Ginny, your kickers are really dull. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever, like. But, uh, but if you ask, negative feedback. But if you asked him, he probably would. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, that's a burden that I don't want to ask my friends. Right. No, I totally, to I totally get that. But I, I do think that that is something that a lot of youngish uh, yeah. writers and reporters need need to recognize that, uh, you know, if you're on the inside of staff, you complain that well, everybody here is too busy to mentor me, and if you're on the outside as a freelancer, you assume, as you did, that, oh, if only I was on staff, I would get this, I would be in this intensely nurturing uh, environment. And I the reality is that I, it just doesn't really exist anymore. I think I, w I would, I, th I mean, I agree generally, but I think that people who are on staff and who are working in a large open room with like 400 other people or whatever, which is kind of what the average traditional newsroom looks like, um, I'd hate to think how many they're in the newsroom at the journal, so it, Actually, you underestimate the degree to which you're actually touching people all day and having two-second conversations about, like, well, do I, you know, when I say the word human, what do you think I mean? I mean, that kind of yeah. stuff, which is, you know, it's like being on a basketball team. You sort of, you're all individualists, but you're touching each other as you run down the court. Yeah, yeah. Professor yeah. Rennie may have something to say. Let's Professor Rennie, would you, would you please uh, jump in? How dare you, sir? <laughs> yeah, wait for the mic, wait for the mic. <laughs> no, I was oh, actually, right, yeah, I was going to ask, don't, do we not feel like that's a problem, though, that more mentoring doesn't happen in a newsroom? Because um, I work in a newsroom, but I'm not a journalist, and I think I see that actually as an issue, of like a lot of younger people not really having that development process, especially as digital journalism has completely changed kind of the cycle of how editing and publishing happens. There's no hard deadlines on something. There's not kind of that forced action of, okay, now we talk about your work. I don't know, I think there's, I, that's, that's a, from an outside perspective that there's sort of like this laid back, like yeah, everybody develops themselves, you all support each other. Ah, so I mean a kind of formal, let's sit down and discuss your progress as a functioning science journalist I slash human most being? other <laughs> industries have that type of development process, or at least, so I'm on the technology side of things. I think it's insane that you don't develop people. So you know, when somebody comes in as a brand new product manager, you foster how they handle problems, how they approach things. There's, it's, I'm not talking about like a formal annual review, let's sit down and talk about how you've developed, but kind of more what you're saying, where it's like, that could be a bit better. Let's, let's work on this specific thing. I think it's... Yeah, my, my husband works for JetBlue and that's his job, is to develop people, professional, professional development. Right. And um, it's sad that we don't have that in our profession, I guess. I assumed it happened somewhere in our, I mean, it does happen on rare occasions, right? When, when an editor <laughs> and a writer have been. I'm sorry, am I giving an unusually blank <laughs> response look? <laughs> Well, no, it's not, it's not, uh, maybe when my blank look is as follows, and I think it would probably echo Dan's <coughs> back there, which is, you know, we all yearn for mentors, actually. Um, we all yearn for uh, creative and useful feedback that goes beyond the, are you done yet? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know that, um, you know, at least in daily journalism, that that's, 
that's ever been true. Well, um, I don't think, I, but we don't yeah. think that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think it was I not viewed a as a problem because there were a finite number of outlets and an infinite resource of young people who were willing to be abused yeah. to you know, try and figure a way to jam themselves into an existing mm -hmm. template. Now, I suspect it's quite different because, see, when I listen to you talk, you yearn a little bit for the sort of structure of my situation. But you have an incredible sort of uh, uh, empowering and I would imagine quite terrifying freedom to kind of do whatever you want. Oh, I have a blog. I have a thousand words here where I can kind of say anything I want and nobody, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this, I'm responsible for myself. I work for myself, exclamation point, we were talking. Um, that's different. That's yeah, but I something that, say, someone like me in my world doesn't have. But the great thing about freelancing is that everything I do, I am compensated for. Sure. So you work more, you get compensated more, mm -hmm. which if your staffer doesn't doesn't happen, right? right? I could say that I get compensated for everything I don't do. Yeah, right. <laughs> See, I think that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, John, please. No, I, I, I don't know, weighing in on a lot of this. I mean, I, I, I would agree that I think yeah. it is a problem if there's a general sense that people feel that they're not getting the kind of mentorship, partly because I, I feel like I was such a beneficiary of that myself. I got, you know, like starting at Scientific American, mm. getting to be edited by Armin Schwab and Tim Appenzeller was mm -hmm. an absolute joy because they were two of the best editors I ever worked with, partly because they were utter, utter gentlemen, and they established a kind of mold for a kind of editing that I've tried to do since then. I mean, because I, 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 be, I don't know always the kind of editing feedback other people get in the course of their work, but I know, especially when I'm starting off working with some people, I like to try to give some sort of comments. If I'm going in and making some sort of changes to give some indication of, here's why I think this is a good idea, so that Intrinsically, I'd like to think that represents sort of mentorship because it's suggesting here's the way we try to do things here. Ah, it would yeah. be great to have a kind of uh, conversation right. about building people. Also, I mean, I have to say, you know, having been in that manager situation, if nothing else, you really are, you know, if you're overseeing an editorial staff, you do have that the horrible exercise of the end of the year review with people. And some of the things that you get into are what they're good at and what they're not good at. And I mean, in some ways, if you are, it, it's such a horrible thing to have to be getting rid of people that you can spend a lot of time mentoring people who frankly may not be the best performers. It's sometimes the people who are at the upper end of things may actually not get as much feedback to being, for helping them get pushed along to become even better unless they actively seek it out. I wonder if there's a, a kind of a series of cultural uh, differences here that are time dependent. I mean, I think magazines have, are certainly pressure cookers, but they have a lead time and they have a, uh, uh, an opportunity to at least one day a week or something to kind of stop and have a long lunch. Um, I wonder if in the current environment, which is true, I think, as much internally in a large uh, organization as it is for a freelancer, where everyone is in the church of now. Yeah. Um, you know, no one has, uh, uh, you're feeding the, the this platform and the newswire and the Twitter feed and the uh, this and the that, and no one has time to even actually even say, is it done yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, so but when- It's interesting what you said, maybe I just need, to, maybe it's the, the responsibility falls on the freelancer to seek it out and at figure out who, you know, I, presumably an editor, not your, it'd be easier for me to ask editors than to ask uh, friends, even though, as Dan said, my, some of my friends probably would, but I know that it's, there's, you know, Ed Young doesn't have a lot of extra time, I presume, so. Well, also, I mean, one of these funny things that can happen is that you have a community. Ed Young, for those of you who don't know, a wonderful science blogger, I don't know where he's based these London. days, but he has been based in London, so you can have this close <coughs> professional colleague who's actually, you know, 3,500 miles away, um, and yet there's an immediacy, and it's, so that's kind of jarring. So what do you do, though? So there you are, you, I've got a nice ergonomic chair um, and a good <laughs> desk. No, that's not an insubstantial thing. Um, and then when you need to sort of think, you cut loose and go to the library. 
What are the things that you're doing for yourself now to try and answer that need for professional community? Or have you just suddenly arrived at this sense of isolation? No, I, I'm trying to read more about craft. And I'm trying to, I listen to the long form podcast. I don't know you, if Evan was, Evan, was we here. We talked a little so. bit about it, but um, we focused more on other things. It's a fantastic podcast. He interviewed, or he and his two co-hosts inter every week interview an amazing either long form writer or long form editor. And what I've picked up just listening to those episodes is incredible craft tips. And um, so I think I've been trying to, I you know, most of it is just, I know that Helcom Gladwell has come into a lot of uh, criticism over the last few months for his most recent book, but you know the 10,000 hours thing that may or may not be true? Like I kind of buy that. Like I, you just have to, at a certain point you have to stop talking about craft and just like try it, like write more. And that's one thing that's been great about the blog is um, it's my weekly thing. Some weeks are better than others, some posts are better than others, but it's a practice. It's a like regimented thing where I, you, just by doing something more and more, I think you get better at it, hopefully. So, so speaking of that, Jenny, can we, can we uh, talk a little bit about, about the blog? Because I, I think a lot of people in the room are thinking, yeah, blogging is something that I like to do. It comes pretty easily to me. There's a lot of freedom, et cetera. You know, what it doesn't do is, is deliver a lot of compensation, even for somebody like you that is, that is you know, now has a wonderful platform at, at Nat Geo, a really primo science yeah. journalism uh, <coughs> platform. So, you know, if, if you were looking for the most efficient way to, you know, generate dollars per hour of input, that certainly wouldn't be the way to go. Uh, so, I guess, how, how do you sort of think that through, suss it out? I remember we asked David Dobbs that question a couple of years ago, and he's like, I just have no idea. I haven't really even thought about it. I just do it because I like it, you know? But, but I, I sense, and I'm hoping that you are, you are a little bit more strategic. In, oh, in your I have a formula. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, so, so talk to us about that. <laughs> and, got my and pen out, all right. G give I the have, it's very easy. It's called the two out of three rule. Okay. And for every assignment or opportunity that comes in front of me, I say, does it meet two out of three of the following? A lot of money, um, a career boost slash exposure, or a passion project that I'm really into. So if a magazine that pays well comes to me with an assignment, uh, if, if a, you know, a well-known magazine that pays well comes to me with an assignment that I don't care about, I will do it because it's money and exposure. If it's, uh, you know, Aeon, my Aeon story was about Romanian orphans. Yeah, uh, splendid story too, I must say. It was, um, a story I worked on for a year. I tried to sell it to many places. It never got sold. So that was, and the, you know, Aeon is a pretty unknown place. Um, but so my two out of three for that was a passion project. It was really a passion story that I had worked on for a long time. And it was my first real long form clip. So that to me was the career boost part of it. The pay was not very good. So that, so, but I think even if the balance shifts from one time, like, you know, if you need to pay rent this month, maybe that the money part of the arm becomes the dominant thing that month and you will do any assignment that pays a certain amount. It doesn't, the two out of three is not like a set in stone thing, but I do think it's important. And I try to say this as much as possible that like to be a successful freelancer, you can't, you can't have this idea that you're going to do only your passion projects all the time. You are a business. You work, you know, you have to think like a small business owner that has, you know, that, that pays, that has responsibilities and pays bills. And um, the point of having money is to, ha to give yourself opportunities to make yourself happy and do what you want to do, whether that's like a vacation with your family or a passionate, a story that you're really passionate about. So, so I'm curious, so <coughs> Virginia Hughes, Inc. here, the, the business, so are you incorporated? 
No, I'm not no. because it's very expensive in New York to incorporate, but I probably should. Okay. Do you have a business plan? Uh, no. Maggie Kurth Baker, whom you may know as a mm -hmm. science editor, Boing Boing, I mean, she and her husband, she does a business plan every year, and I think once a month or every couple of months, they sit down at the kitchen table and they read out her business plan and see where she is that year. And, you know, that's how she sort of manages this. But you, but you improvise, yeah? Um, yeah, I have, um, yeah, I definitely What's improvise. your mechanism <laughs> for making sure you don't lose the passion projects? Let me ask it that way. Mm. To use the example of the Romanian orphanage piece for Aeon, which is 6,000 words. Mm. Um, and clearly, I mean, involved like a lot of travel, a lot of upfront in, uh, investment, not just in um, travel expenses, but kind of in mental, emotional investment expenses. I mean, it's clearly a story you put a lot of yourself into. And as you just said, for a long time, you had no place to put it. Yeah. But how do you, how do you broker that? Well, how in, a, in an age of top 10 lists and cat photos and, <laughs> you know, 700 word quick hits, how do you find a way to create the space and the business space for those passion projects? I just think that, so I have two examples, that's what I'm going off of, where this has worked for me. So I guess the, the, le the bottom line is that if you, if you just, if you do good work, eventually it will see the light of day. And you, you can't expect from the, you can't know ahead of time how that will play out exactly, but you just have to, if you really want to do something, then just do it. So the Romanian orphan story, so I knew I wanted to start doing long yeah, form. Sure, share a little of the background. Yeah, so the Romanian people. orphan story is a story about um, uh, a 14 year scientific project where American scientists went to Romania and they took a bunch of babies in orphan. Uh, so there was no foster care 14 years ago. Or Under the Ceausescu. <coughs> in yeah, Ceausescu yeah. regime, right. All these babies were in orphanages because the communist regime uh, had this idea that they would be loyal to the state. if So they, they banned birth control, and then all these poor women would just dump their kids off at the orphanage. So there were hundreds of thousands of, of Romanian orphans. And then... Uh, through the 80s and 90s and so and there was no foster care to speak of because everyone just thought well the state's taking care of it um, of the kids so these Americans went over 14 years ago and decided to do a scientific study where they took a group of about 150 orphans and they left half of them in the orphanage and they they set up foster care for the very first time and put the other half in foster care. And then they followed them for the last 14 years and they've studied their brain development and psychological development. So this is the first scientific study proving essentially, or one of the first, proving that um, orphanages are bad for ch children's brain development. So you can imagine all the ethical issues involved in this where you're intentionally leaving half of these kids in, in orphanages. when most of the Western world knows that orphanages are bad for, for kids. So my story is about, so the way that happened is actually not because I'm passionate about that story, mm -hmm. even though now I, I am, it's a very interesting story. Um, it was more that I knew I wanted to do long form journalism and I wasn't getting any opportunities to do so because I'd never done it before and you know, where do you get an idea? And, so I wrote for Safari, actually, that the main researcher who does this orphanage work happens to do some autism work, kind of um, as his secondary project. So I was writing a profile about him. And this is? Uh, Chuck Nelson at yeah. Harvard. Um, so I was writing a profile of him and his autism work for this autism client that I have. So I was visiting him, and I spent the day at his lab, and part of the profile, he tells me about the Romanian orphan stuff that he's done. And he was like, you can come with me the next time I go to Romania if you want. I was like, that sounds really interesting. When am I going to get in? That sounds like a long form story maybe. And I could travel and do all this kind of, you know, sexy stuff that you're supposed to do as a journalist. And like, So I followed up with him and ended up, he was like, well, I'm going in December. This was last year. And so I tried to sell the story ahead of time before I went, but nobody's going to buy my 
first of all, I didn't really know what the story was until I got there and kind of understood the whole thing. So it's hard for me to like even, I'm, I reread the pitches that I sent out before I went and they're not, I understand why nobody jumped on them. Who did you pitch it to? <clears throat> the Atlantic and um, Slate. Actually, Laura Helmuth at Slate was like, sure, we'll do a bunch of, we'll do three or four stories on Romanian orphans if you want to do it. But Slate stories are, I think they pay $400 each and it wasn't, it wasn't the type of place I want. I wanted a like, you know, bona fide long form story. Um, where else did I pitch it? A couple of, oh, Mother Jones, mm -hmm. um, the Christian Science Monitor, Mm -hmm. You know, no response, pretty much, or a mm -hmm. boilerplate rejection. Mm -hmm. So I just, it's actually not that expensive to go to Romania. <laughs> um, you know, the flight was like 700 bucks, and then the hotel was very cheap. So I just thought, like, well, I'll just make an investment in this experience. And if I mm -hmm. never sell the story, at that time I had the national, I knew I was going to start the National Geographic blog, so I thought, like, well, at very least, I could turn it into a bunch of blog posts, maybe a series on the blog. So it's not like the researcher is going to be mad at me for never writing about mm -hmm. him because it'll be. So I just went. So you invested in the risk. Yeah, I, I thought of it actually as like a training for myself. Like I'm investing in this training of on the you know travel reporting where I'm going to be on this very intense reporting. I went to an orphanage. That still, the Romania still has orphanages and they're awful. They're dirty and gross, and the kids are all stunt, like their growth is stunted and they have all these developmental issues. And so it was like an experience that I wouldn't, I just felt like it was worth the $2,000 I spent on it, whatever. And then I came back and I went to actually a writer's retreat with a bunch of other science writers. and. Um, a few months after I got back and I was like, I'm really depressed. I don't know what to do. I've tried pitching the story and we just workshopped the pitch at this retreat. And, um, and I ended up writing the first section of it. And then I sent the whole first section to the editor at Aeon. And she was like, she wrote me back like 14 minutes later. <laughs> I was like, yes, I'll take this. So, um, Interesting. so it, it was just like, I, you just have to kind of like, if you want to do something, yeah, I guess it's a risk. I guess it's, it's just like you're never gonna, if you wanna do something hard, nobody's ever gonna just let you do it um, without, like you have to, it's kind of the, I, somebody said to me once, I think my sister said this to me, she's been, a wait, she's been a waitress many times throughout her life, and it's kind of like waitressing where nobody ever wants to hire you as a waitress if you haven't had experience as a waitress but how are you gonna get experience unless somebody hires you as a waitress? So it's kind of like you have to find some way to get yourself some experience as a long form writer or whatever. And then once you have that little bit of experience, you could like leverage that into something more. So once I did that story, I felt confident enough to pitch to matter. Um, and now I've done those two, so now I've- I And mean, so what did you pitch to matter? Just to, this is, <coughs> um, privacy piece. Yeah, so it actually, my original pitch to them was about, um, I, I wrote this blog post for my blog about uh, this crazy research, people who want to use genetic testing to find missing children. So if you have parents who are missing, like these are children in, uh, say, South America oh, who have oh, been Argentina. kidnapped or yeah, something, yeah. Um, you just do the genetic test on both their parents and then you know, if a, if a missing kid shows up in some other part of the world, you could do a genetic test on them and match, match them up. This technology is available now, and there are a bunch of researchers who want to do this. So I, was, I pitched that story to Matter, and they were like, uh, I don't know. And then that kind of turned into this other story about genetic privacy. No, so, so this started as a blog post. Mm -hmm. um, and the blog post just occurred to you because you were thumbing through. Yeah, it was from yeah. a journal. Okay, thumbing through a journal. So um, you had your blog post, which you get a big response to the blog post? No. Or just no response to the blog post? So because there was no response, you thought, well, this must be a yeah. really good story. I don't know. Um, and I, I should dig into it I was interested in it. I was interested in it. You were interested in it. And I thought, I think, I know what's going to get a good response from the blog and like a heavy story about missing kids is not a that's, I, it was understandable to me that that maybe wouldn't be the highest trafficking post as compared to like, why does music affect our 
mood, which gets like 100,000 hits or something. Oh, right, so, yeah, yeah. you know, the blog traffic isn't always representative of like what makes a good story. Um, well, so what I'm wondering though is the relationship between um, you're, you're multitasking, you have multi clients, you have multi story placement obligations. Um, and to what degree you can overlap um, subjects. To, uh, you can write something for the blog and then mm, think about it a little bit more and turn it into a pitch for matter and then do that and then maybe you do something else with it. It generates another blog item. These are all kind of competitors. Um, don't tell them that. Well, I don't know, but I mean it's a... Well, it's not... Um, I'm just wondering how you, how you, how you um, preserve the illusion of exclusivity. I've never ever implied to any of them that I am doing something exclusively for them. Like I said, I'm in business for myself, free agent. Unless they want to give me a yearly salary with benefits, uh, they don't have an, any kind of exclusivity on me. And I would never, I mean, even matter, my agreement with them is that uh, they get first, they're supposed to get first what do you what do you call it? Um, well, first, right of first refusal. First refusal. First refusal. Yeah, okay. Right, but that's for any of my pitches that would be appropriate for matter, which means for any pitch that would be a six thousand word story or more. Mm -hmm. Which you know I'm not going to go to them with every blog post idea. So also like editors don't have time to. Nobody reads the contracts and nobody like nobody's checking in on. Frankly, I think part of the reason that matter was interested in me as a contributing editor is because I have this platform on the blog and Twitter and all the other crap. And so I don't think it, I think it benefits them if I have, like let's say I had some big story in the New York Times Magazine or something, that, that one of their contributing editors would be in a big publication like that would be a good thing. Assuming I gave them the story first and they said no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. So I don't, I actually, that competitor question that, um, has never come up, ever. No one's ever. Well, I'm just sort of thinking more kind of in the sense, I understand what you're saying, that yes, <coughs> if you're identified uh, as a contributing editor to matter um, in some larger venue that then creates publicity for everybody. But I'm sort of talking about where you're actually competing with yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, um, okay, so I'm doing this piece for uh, was it Mosaic that makes you write the, the draconian uh, Creative Commons license yeah. or whatever it is? <laughs> so, okay, so they own the, the innermost thoughts of your, of your <laughs> secret self. Um, but you'd like to kind of peel off an anecdote from this piece you're working on for them and put it in your blog and then like yeah. that. See, that's the dance I'm kind of curious about. Not, not the larger one, which, which is a kind of a more classical intellectual property publication rights thing. No. How do you steal from yourself yeah. and not get caught? So there are important lines to draw, I think. Um, and if I'm ever in doubt, I just write to the editor and say, how would you feel if I wrote a blog post that isn't really related to your story but happens mm -hmm. to use the same source? Like when the sources are the same, that's when I when there's sort of a red flag of like, ah. are they going to be mad? Mm -hmm. um, but often the sources aren't the same. Where the you know one source will give you an idea and a background about something, and then you you do the reporting and and end up not quoting that other source. So, you know, for me, I, right now I write mostly. I'm kind of a beat reporter in a way where I write about neuroscience and genetics and there's enough overlap in everything that I write about that nobody gets, like if you, if you wanted to find connections, you could probably find a connection between all of my stories to some extent. So um, how do I, do, I mean, yeah, if it's the same source, that's, that's when I think about it. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some bloggers, I mean, Chris Mooney certainly comes to mind, but others use their blogs as a way of kind of workshopping um, like ideas, a book, right? Or workshopping parts of a book. Uh, uh, Annie Murphy Paul does that, mm -hmm. um, who is a very good sort of, well, actually kind of in your general ballpark learning she's great. neuroscience. Um, and she's very uh, clear and, and, and upfront about it, and I assume upfront about it with whatever publisher she's working for. Um, but she will explicitly kind of put things out in her blog, in part as a way of creating a sense of community around an idea that she's working on, both to get the kind of feedback that you 
seem to feel the want of, uh, but also to create an appetite for the idea. It's like trailers for a movie. People want to see something they think they've already seen. Do you, well, do you I, use I your blog I that way? Like, um, I guess I feel like if somebody commissions me and I, I sign a contract for a story, they, they own that story from me. Mm -hmm. So I would never repackage that. I would never tell that same story for another outlet. Mm -hmm. And I would never tell that same story for my blog, unless I was, you know, writing a teaser post that was just like, go look over here at this other story I wrote for whoever. So, but do they own like all the reporting I did for that story, even if it is tangential? I mean, frankly, they don't know about all the reporting I might have done for a story. And since I over report, a lot of the reporting I do for a story doesn't end up in the story. So, um, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like, pornography or you know it when you see it you know if it you know if you're stealing an idea or if it's really a different idea so oh good where ah yeah. thank you sorry hi um, my question is about your piece that got um, into the best American science writing um, book so that's not on your beat of really of neuroscience it was about your body the ecosystem and you wrote it for popular science right. so I was wondering how how that piece came about, given that it was maybe in your wheelhouse, or maybe it was when you wrote it. But um, and then, did you have the feeling like this is really good? This is going all the way. Like, <laughs> did you, or were you like totally surprised that 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 would be considered? You know, that the people thought that that was really great. So I would say I think it is in my wheelhouse because well, it's about genetics. Tell us a, for the rest of this. Tell oh, us sure. A about it was about the piece the of popular science. Yeah. And it was about the, this human microbiome project that the NIH is doing. Right. It's about all the microorganisms that live on our skin and inside of our gut. So this was in 2010, I think, or 2011 that it was published. Um, 2011, I think. 2011. Yeah. Uh, so at that time, there hadn't been so much microbiome stuff that there has been now. Um, and my story focused on something that hadn't been written about before, which is the skin part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was about like uh, um, eczema and how maybe the bacteria on our skin relates to eczema. So the way that story came about is I happened to have had lunch with an editor of Popular Science. And then like a month and a half later, one of his underlings called me and was like, we want this story done in two weeks. Can you do it? <laughs> And I said yes. They and said, we're all scratching a lot here. We want a story about eczema, and we think we the want, biome yeah. is a good idea. They, they but literally no, came to me, and they were like, we think you should profile Julie Segre at the N NIH. Mm -hmm. um, you can go down to DC this week, and then if you, if you were able to do it this week, then you could write it next week, and then we have to. It was like a really fast thing. And I had never had a story in that kind of high, like a long story. It wasn't even that long. I think it was 2,500 words. 2,500 um, words is long by standards today. Yeah, it's like a standard feature, I guess. And I would never had a feature in a big national magazine, so I said yes. And then, yes, I was floored when it got into Best American Science Writing, because I didn't think it was, it was a popular science feature. It was like a little anecdote at the beginning, and then you get into a bunch of science. It wasn't like... I still, I'm very proud of that piece and I'm very happy it got into that book because it, that helped my brand or whatever, but it's not, it's not anything like what I put into the Matter story or the Romanian orphan story. It's just, it wasn't a narrative feature, it was like an anecdote you know, start with an anecdote and then do an explanatory feature about how the microbiome works. That so was essentially a, I mean not literally, but essentially a sort of single source focus story. Yeah, I, I mean, I reported it out. Oh, yeah, I'm talked, sure. But, but yeah, it was a single lab um, who, had, the, the, their thing that I wrote about was that they, for the first time, had done a survey of all the bacteria that live on the skin. So that was their thing. It wasn't, um, I was definitely surprised that it got picked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you'd have given yourself an award for something else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm curious, because I think part of what got it into that anthology, because it's part of what that anthology is about, is voice. Um, mm. And I'm curious now about how you see your voice and how you fine-tune it and change it depending on what you're doing. I mean, do you have a self-conscious 
Oh, this is my blo brain blogger voice. This is my only human voice. Uh, yeah, I mean, the blog is the only place where I'm, I use the word, I use the first person, and I use it very frequently. I like it. I like talking about my, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, my dog died, and yeah. I did, like, this therapy session on my blog about my dog. So it definitely gets a little bit, probably too much of that sometimes, but I, um, I do feel like it's my only place in my writing landscape where I can really say and have an opinion about something. Um, what my voice is, I don't know. Um, I hope that I come off as like rational and um, clear. That's and and yeah, that was. I hope that's. Well, I'm just curious because <coughs> you know you spent all that time hanging around poets and and fiction <laughs> writers and worrying about uh, the logic of sentences and word choice and not very much about reporting. So I was curious whether this is something that's you're self-conscious about as yeah. a writer. I think a lot of journalists just simply, they have a writing style that begins at the beginning and runs to the end. You know? Yeah. The logic is very important to me. I mean, what um, do you mean? the logic of a paragraph, uh, you know, you start a sentence with A, you end it with B. Then the next sentence starts with B and ends with C. Then the next sentence starts with C and ends with D. So that there's a logical flow of an explanation where the reader doesn't have to jump back up to, to remind themselves of where they are in the explanation or the argument. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Um, so logic is very important to me. I don't, I'm not one of these people who agonizes over word choices. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't read paragraphs out loud over and over and over and get just the right uh, lilt, is that the, that's the poetic term, right? I learned that at Hopkins. <laughs> um, so clarity is what I value, I think, probably more than uh, flowery, you know, beautiful prose. You think they're sort of mutually exclusive? No, no. I, ideally, they would all be in the same. I think that I guess that what I think I'm probably better at is the clarity part, and the the pretty prose part is something I'm still learning to to do. So now I'm curious, if you were starting all over again, how would you do this? What have you taught yourself through the various mistakes you've made? If I were starting out now, what would you tell me? Oh, I would tell you to I. I like pitch as much as possible and get in people's like go to all the networking events and talk to those editors who you think are like Lee I can tell you I've seen you at meetings multiple times and I've never had the courage to just like walk up to you and be like hi I'm a random freelancer how are you Mr. Wall Street Journal so um, I'm really sorry because I never have anybody to talk to at those meetings <laughs> <laughs> so I would say and I know like it kills me to hear, I mean, it's great for them, but when I hear about really young journalists just starting out who sent a random pitch to the New York Times Magazine and it landed, I just said, why wasn't I doing that? Why, even, if it w even if it wasn't gonna work, you know, in the process of pitching, you form relationships with editors, whether it's, even if it's just them writing back to you and saying no, it's your name in their inbox. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's and it's maybe planted a seed in them of like, well, there's this one writer I remember who sent me a pitch about some, you know. So I think <clears throat> right now I don't pitch very much because I have all these relationships already and I don't really need to spend the time doing that. But I wish at the beginning I had been bolder about. Bolder. Yeah. Taking more initiative. More, more. More risk. Like not worried about what people would think of me. I had this idea that like if you pitch someplace and they say no, you've lost your shot. And like I shouldn't pitch to a big place until down the road when I have a really good mm. thing because I'll, I'll mess up my chances. And I didn't realize that editors don't remember when they say no to somebody. Yeah. It's like, in, you know, like maybe they plant a seed in the back of their head, but it's not like they're going to hold it against you the next time. And I actually heard this really disturbing statistic uh, at, I think it was at this most recent National Association of Science Writers meeting where 
some editors were saying, um, I guess it's not a statistic, but they were saying, when I reject a, a female science writer's pitch, they tend to cower away and I never hear from them again. When I reject a male science writer's pitch, they seem to take that as like, oh good, now I can send them four other pitches. So it seems like men in general just try a lot more and that might be part of why there's this huge imbalance in teacher bylines between men and women might partly be our fault in the sense that we're not like putting ourselves out there as much as men do plus a lot of other reasons but that might be one part of it so be bold i guess i would say yeah hey, yeah oh yeah go ahead or <coughs> Of the things that you've done in your career, which are the ones where you just pitched an editor and asked to do something as opposed to being asked to given an assignment? Well, the ones I'm most proud of, I think. The, the Romanian orphan story was mm -hmm. one. Um, the matter story was pitched. Um, the, the privacy, the genetic the, privacy sorry, story. Sorry, genetic yeah. privacy yeah. story, yep. Um, I got a post on the New Yorker blog uh, earlier this year. Oh, that was concussions. Pitched. Yep, concussions. Yeah. And that was one where I was like, that was not only pitched, but I went to a conference and I reported it at a conference because I knew that if I did it at the conference, no one else would have it. it would be an exclusive thing. Um, yeah, that's. I did this. So this one. Oh, I was going to talk about this before. There was this one post I did for the last word on nothing that I think was the reason I got asked to be on National Geographic. It was called Reawakenings and it was the story about this woman who has a crazy sleeping disorder where she just falls asleep all day. And it was a story of a scientist who figured out her problem and found her essentially a drug that treated her condition. And it was a story that I heard about and I pitched to a bunch of newspapers and they all said no. and. I ultimately just said, screw it, I'm going to put it on the blog. So it was this like 3,000 word piece on the last word on nothing blog. Um, and that ended up winning this blogging award this year. So yeah, I think you just be bold and try stuff. Can I ask you a question related to that? Jenny, I, I think that what a lot of young freelance, you know, based on what they tell me, uh, are wondering about is is they're sort of thinking, look, should I be really systematic about this and get a million pitches out and build my business, you know, make sure that I've got, you know, a constant string of five or six hundred word stories and okay, I'm gonna tell myself to write one longer piece every two months or whatever. You know, to you know, really sort of have a system and try to approach this thing. Versus I'm 25 or 27 or 23, whatever, this is the time in my life when I want to just go do something adventurous and have an immersion somewhere and come out with, with you know, some amazing experiential journalism that, you know, maybe I can sell or maybe I can't, but at least I can post it somewhere, sort of analogous to, mm. you know, the piece that you put on Anne's site, on, on the Last Word site. I think a lot of people are, are sort of feeling pulled in two directions on that. You know, wh whether whether to really try to build something sort of mechanically, the way you would construct a machine, uh, versus the sort of more adventure type approach. So I would say, you know, if you want to have a career in journalism, um, like I don't think I'd ever have been able to sell that Romanian orphan story if I hadn't had the six years of experience and practice before. So if you want to have an adventure and an experience, by all means have it when you're 23 or 25. If you want to be able to sell that to a magazine or whatever, then I think you need to have a systematic, you have to put in your 10,000 hours. Um, and I really, you know, I, ha I didn't, like, even though it seems like this just came out of nowhere, I have been working since 2006 as a, you know, writing um, full time, almost full time, I guess full time since 2007. So it took uh, five or six years before I could, like, actually sell stuff. So. 
my, I guess my answer would be if you want to be a successful freelance journalist, you have to do the former, the systematic, put the hours in thing. But, you know, if you want to go have an around the world adventure and stay in hostels and whatever, you probably won't want to do that when you're 30. So do it. I mean, I don't know. Another way to think about it is say, yeah, go ahead and have the adventure, but j just don't assume that it's necessarily going to be career building. Instead, it'll yeah. be, it'll inform your life in amazing ways, but but not necessarily be the optimal approach to you know yeah. building your freelance career. I don't know. Does anybody want to push back on that? I mean, we've got some successful freelancers in the room. I'm just curious about what yeah. people think about that. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. I'm it also depends on your lifestyle, right? Like my first year or two, I did a lot of tutoring to supplement. And there are a lot of writers who have mm. day jobs where they have their adventures and that's what sustains them and that's what they write about, but that's not what pays their rent every month. So you kind of have to decide like, and if you live in New York City, it's very different than if you live in where I'm from, Marshall, Michigan, where there aren't any houses that cost more than three hundred thousand dollars. So, I mean, it's just it's a lot of choices. Well, I want to say that you made a great choice by deciding to accept our invitation to come <laughs> here this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because you've for really given us a really excellent and I think very um, honest and uh, insightful look into your juggling act and uh, the ways that you are inventive and you do take the big bet on the risks. I mean, I think that's what's so interesting is it's, it's you've invested the 10,000 hours in yourself, not in something out there. And that's clearly paying off. And I look forward to reading more of what you do. But in the meantime, thanks a lot for spending the time with us this evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot.